Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. It's titled uh, Hydra Keys, Hydra Car, Remotely Exploiting Connected Vehicle APIs and Apps. Um, anybody know LeVar Ball? Anybody? I was going to walk out like that, but if you don't know him, don't even worry. I, had, I figured it wasn't going to be a complete uh, presentation without LeVar Ball. <laughs> uh, so my name is Aaron Guzman. Uh, my Twitter handle, uh, ScriptingXSS. It'll probably say AARON, so if any of you guys have seen uh, <laughs> any of the skits, uh, you'll know where it's from. Uh, first things first, I love pizza. I had pizza for breakfast. I had pizza probably twice already. Uh, serious fanatic about pizza. Second, I live in Los Angeles. Um, I work for uh, Gotham Digital Science, uh, an Aon company. I like to hack all the things, anything IoT, anything connected vehicles, anything embedded, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm, I'm head first into it. I also uh, was a technical editor for a book called uh, Practical Internet of Things Security. I'm actually co-authoring a book right now called Pen Testing. It's a pen testing cookbook uh, for IoT. And that should be released in the next couple, couple of months, uh, hopefully, in the last couple chapters right now. Um, aside from that, I'm a board member for OWASP and Cloud Security Alliance, Southern California. Uh, I also contribute a lot to OWASP and Cloud Security Alliance. So for OWASP, I am a project leader. Uh, or help lead uh, a project called Embedded Application Security Project. Uh, so makes mostly embedded Linux, but also some RTOS as well. And I uh, contribute to a lot for Cloud Security Alliance IoT Working Group, uh, and even their connected vehicle uh, guidance documents and IoT uh, for uh, secure deployment. And here is my vehicle that we're going to be talking about. So today's topic is Subaru Starlink Remote Services in Vehicle Technology. Just to kind of set what, what that is, what Subaru Starlink is capable of doing is you could unlock the car, honk the horn, locate the vehicle, locate the owner, have a vehicle health report so you can check whether your oil is at the right stage, uh, if anything's going on with your ABS, uh, get monthly reports, weekly reports. Uh, so it could be pretty detailed. And this is all with their telematics. Uh, you could also you know, schedule your services and track your history as well, your mileage. Uh, get notifications, uh, but what it doesn't do, it doesn't remote start your vehicle, but it's not to say that that cannot be added here. It's only a $300 add-on, um, but that was kind of out of scope for my research. I wanted to get what was installed, what was used within uh, Starlink, uh, Starlink in-vehicle technology. So um, I started with, okay, I actually had purchased uh, a vehicle in 2016 thinking it had telematics uh, installed but uh, come to find out, only some 2016 uh, versions of Subaru or models do have Starlink. But so far, they have official versions of 2017 and 18 vehicles. And I think all 2017 and 18 vehicles now have uh, Subaru Starlink by default. Um, so you would have to uh, purchase a subscription, but it's always connected. So, you know. Um, so. And some of, the, some of the motivations and, and research that I started with, like, this is why I kind of got a, a Subaru, is I figured there was no research in this space as far as uh, security research for connected vehicles on, on uh, the Subaru aspect. Uh, aside from tuning, tuning a car, it's a rally car, so uh, it's an STI, so usually there's some modifications made to uh, the engine to compensate for the ECU and air intake, for example. Uh, so anything changing... Uh, within the, the, the vehicle's, uh, let's say, engine, you'd have to tune it. So, and there's already uh, verified manufacturers who are out there that do that. But as far as security is concerned, I didn't find anything that was out there. So there's an area of interest. Uh, and like I said, only 2016 and up have a telematics. So when I purchased mine, I literally you know, thought that I was going to have to, uh, well, I actually did purchase the 2018 one, <laughs> just to literally, just to, just to hack the vehicle. And we'll go through some of the, some of the steps that I went through. But also, I, no, I noticed that you know, the DMC exemption for security research last October uh, occurred. As long as it's law, the, the device or uh, whatever item you're researching is lawfully acquired, uh, good faith research, uh, so you're not trying to harm anybody, and it's in a controlled environment. And also, if it happened uh, after uh, October 28, 2016. So obviously, that's... That's already way past that. So uh, that was good. that's good for me. I'm not going to get in trouble. It's my car. Uh, I want to have some fun with it. And I always wanted an STI. I always thought they were pretty cool, pretty fast, uh, pretty fun cars. And like I said, I had a 2016 version. And um, so my 2016 version, I, I spoke here last year at IoT Village, and I shared some of the findings 
Uh, so the first thing I did uh, was that, you know, I found multiple bugs there. And we'll go through uh, what, those, what those actually look like. So let's jump right into the demo so I can show you exactly what I found and uh, go through the methodology of it. So it's smaller than I would like, but let's go ahead and uh, I'll walk you through. There's no uh, audio uh, right now. So I figured, hey, I'm from LA. Might as well take a video uh, in Santa Monica. Uh, and literally, this is a week after getting my car. We'll go through the timeline in just a bit. But I don't even have plates on the thing. Um, uh, I'm basically right now talking about uh, what I'm going to show. And that's uh, unlocking the car, uh, honking the horn, flashing the lights. I'm going to add two users to uh, this, uh, my Subaru account that have access to my vehicle. And also show that the keys are going to be on the roof. So I'm locking the vehicle, making sure it honks. You can see the lights here. I'm going to go ahead and put those keys right on top of the roof. And from here, I'm setting up, just going to show that there are no authorized users in my Subaru account. So there's no users here. They, they would show up here, email addresses. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and run my exploit script in just a second here. Then you'll see, um, we'll see the magic happen. So of course, it's a Python script, like everything else, right? Um, so I'm running up my, my Subaru uh, exploit script here. And uh, what it's doing is bypassing authorization, uh, gaining a session, CSRFing uh, remote service requests, meaning unlocking the car, honking the horn, flashing the lights. You can also locate the vehicle as well, like I said, in the owner. Uh, but for this particular video, uh, it's only unlocking the vehicle, honking the horn, flashing the lights, and adding two users. So it's going to take just a second. Uh, you'll see the lights flash. See, it's, it's the car is now unlocked. And uh, we have no audio, but it would honk uh, right now. And I'm going to go ahead and show, show the car being unlocked. By the way, I'll take a second. Um, one of the uh, organizers for AppSec California, it's the last weekend of January, right on the beach in Santa Monica. So it's an OWASP conference. So here we go. It unlocked. Let's go ahead and um, open the door. There it is. Same backpack that I have right here. And now I'm going to see, still see the keys up here. And now we're going to see that um, two users have been added to the account to the My Subaru account associated with my car, my vehicle. So now I have two users here that are, that are, are joined. It says car hacking email and car hacking email at gmail two or at one at gmail. So you'll see it right now. I have a separate video screen share to show you um, what's happening on the screen. And uh, these two users have full access to the vehicle, as in they could unlock the car, honk the horn, flash the lights, view everything, locate, like I said, locate the owner as well and the vehicle where it's at. So they have kind of full control. There's no delegated access to uh, the My Subaru account. So in essence, it's almost their car. So here's, here's a screen share uh, of the adding the authorized users and showing you that there isn't any users here. This is my vehicle 2017, uh, WRX STI. So no authorized users. Go ahead and just refresh just to show you guys that I'm not faking anything, you know. <laughs> and uh, I'll go ahead and run my Python script. And again, bypass this authorization here. Takes a second. It's literally going through uh, the internet. It's going through AWS is what the uh, provider has. Um, so it takes about five to 10 seconds for the calls to execute. So I added two users here. And then I'm, I'm unlocking the car. And you can see I have a, a, an active session here. And now I'm honking the horn and flashing the lights. And then it gives me a 200 OK afterwards. Just a second. So it, it'll honk for 30 seconds. So now that we know we have two users added here, let's go ahead and log in as those two users that have delegated access, or not delegated access, but full control. So I'm Aaron here, and I'm going to log into, you see there's two different emails.
And now here's a different browser logged into my car hacking uh, email account. They don't have to have a, a Subaru at all, by the way. So here's the remote services that they have access to. And again, lock, unlock, honk the horn, locate the vehicle. So that's, that's, those are the demos. Those are the, the research, the research aspect of it. And I'm going to show you kind of the methodology and the step-by-step -step process that I took to, to locate those and uh, discover you know, the exploits and, and how uh, the vulnerabilities arose. Uh, and again, I, I've, I've dealt with Subaru at a small capacity last year. Um, so <laughs> introducing the Subaru WRX STI, World Remote Executable. It's all going through the internet. It's all going through cloud. It's always connected. It worked 100% of the time. Uh, when I first found it, it was literally the week of RSA. And I was on the airplane, and I was looking at my camera. Uh, of course, I have a camera in my garage. And I was still writing the script, and it still worked 120% of the time. Uh, and that's because there is a token that never, ever expires. And again, the remote service calls, it can be a CSRF. So, um, so that's how it always worked. And also, to execute it uh, for an, an attack, you'd have, you can utilize the uh, cross-site scripting that I'll show in just a minute. So after you know, they're, they're, you know, the, uh, uh, the exploits happen, uh, about the beginning of June, there's some articles written about the research. Um, and again, they're, they're, they're simple, uh, simple findings, and we'll just go through them in just a second. So let's go through the timeline. So again, I purchased a vehicle uh, late January, got the car delivered a couple days later. I actually, I actually pinged uh, Sammy Camp Car. Uh, and I was like, dude, I got a new car. Let's hack it. And about an hour later, uh, verbatim, I was like, he was like, okay, cool. So he's all, uh, send me some dumps and we'll work or something. I was like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing some burp sweet things. I'm proxying the calls. So then an hour later, I was like, actually, dude, it looks pretty simple to do from the mobile and web app. Found an uh, off bypass, session fixation, XSS, and a way to add a user to my account who can also unlock my, uh, who can also unlock my, uh, my car. Going to script it up. He was like, dude, nice. So then I created a video three days later. Uh, at a park, but I was like, ah, uh, you know, I went to RSA, came back, I felt like I could do better. So uh, I, I recorded a video uh, right there in Santa Monica uh, about a couple, you know, a week and a half later. Uh, so that's when, I, once I created the videos, I disclosed the vulnerabilities to Subaru. Uh, they're easy to work with once I found the right people to talk, people to talk to. Uh, Subaru acknowledged right away. And about a month from uh, disclosing the bugs, uh, they fixed the critical findings uh, that were located or discovered, uh, which is pretty fast for any company, really, especially a car manufacturer uh, who doesn't have a security team. So, but again, they were easy to work with. They were very open, um, and even to suggestions as well. Uh, they definitely came back. We had some dialogue. So they, they weren't closed off to the community at all. Uh, about a couple weeks, a few weeks later, uh, they released a new My Subaru app for Android and iOS. So basically, almost all redone, but they still had the original web application that I was showing. Um, so during that time, I gave a talk over at uh, Austin in Australia on an, on an uh, embedded subject. And that's when I got in touch with a journalist uh, who basically went back and forth with Subaru to verify. And around the same time, literally the same day that the article published, they also pushed a new web application uh, similar to mobile applications. So I don't know if there was some correlation there. Uh, but again, they were easy to work with. They were very embracive to, like, to the community. Um, and you usually like to point them in the right direction as well. So again, pretty, you know, not too bad of a timeline, especially when they were fixed. The critical bugs, that is. Um, you know, they also gave me some credit on their, on their uh, Android and iOS app. So where I first started looking at this, uh, when trying to tackle this problem, not this problem, but trying to, trying to research a connected vehicle, um, you know, I've, I've read the news, I've read the car hacking handbook, uh, I know web app and mobile hardware hacking. Um, so I knew that it had, it had Bluetooth, so I started with a threat model. I knew it had Bluetooth, I knew it had 4G that ran over AT&T, I knew it had RF for the key fobs, uh, I knew there was an SD card, I knew there was, I could do something with OBD2, go, go into the Canvas uh, research, which is kind of what everybody's doing. I kind of want to do something different. And I knew I could mess with the ECU or use a third party like Cobb, uh, who basically flashes the ECU for tuning, um, which is an area of research that I'm going to get into if anybody wants to help out. 
and also infotainment systems. So these are all areas that are kind of familiar already within the car hacking uh, community, community or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but there's also the easy stuff, and for me it's the easy stuff, uh, is the apps, uh, Android, Android app, iOS app, and the web app. Uh, and for me, you know, this is the best part about uh, anything uh, connected is it's basically, you know, the attack surface is huge, so we love IoT, right? It's easy, because why? Hard work sucks. I just picked the easiest, the weakest link, uh, you know, within the whole attack surface here. And for me, what's the quickest and fastest without spending so much time and effort? I figure I'm gonna look at the, I'm gonna look at the apps first. Granted, if it's an ECU uh, type of vulnerability or infotainment, sometimes you know it'll have to go through a whole recall depending on the severity. But I'm I'm fine with that. I'm fine with going through the mobile apps. So again. Hard work sucks. I'm going to the easiest, weakest link for me, uh, which is the AppSec area. So where does everybody start in any type of AppSec? If you're familiar with mobile, Android, easiest. So uh, just assemble the APK, uh, analyze the classes, methods, see what has any vulnerabilities, monitor the activities, the services, the intents. I also check my last year's findings from, uh, that I reported to Subaru. Uh, they had some OAuth issues with uh, hard coding the uh, client secret and client ID. So if anybody's familiar with OAuth, that's another entry point into uh, getting access. Uh, so that was fixed, which was cool. Uh, I reviewed the third party libraries. I found out it was a hybrid app, so they were using Cordova, uh, OKHTTP. Uh, so I knew they weren't, you know, pinning, SSL pinning, so I could proxy. This is before I even touched, did, you know, installed the app yet. Uh, so afterwards, well, next, next is actually, installing the app and running it, uh, once I found some issues uh, within this area, disassembling, monitoring the classes and methods. So I proxied all the important API calls. Again, uh, logging in, logging out, um, unlocking, locking the vehicle, honking the horn, flashing the lights, locating the vehicle and the owner, uh, and adding users. So I'm just doing recon. I'm not doing any you know, injection attack. I'm literally going and burp and categorizing the, the API calls. Then I move on to iOS. This is the same, similar thing, uh, I just assemble the IPA, dump, dump and analyze the classes and methods, uh, analyze the runtime behavior. Uh, I checked my last year's iOS findings, and they had an auto login uh, handoff token, which had been resolved last year when I, when I talked at uh, IoT Village. Somehow it got remerged, and it is not resolved. So that's a key, that's a key item here for me, because any token that's inherently uh, trusted from, it, what it was, it was inherently trusted from the mobile app to all, basically the APIs to everything, basically. Um, so I noted that down, it wasn't fixed. Uh, I also reported that caching of all requests and responses were occurring. It was kind of resolved, they took off the sensitive uh, items when caching, but they still cached a lot. It's like, okay, you know. From there, I continue to analyze storage, uh, plist, SQLite databases, uh, local storage, Realm databases as well. And then from there, I proxied uh, the API calls again, similar to the Android app. Again, log in, log out, uh, unlock, honk the horn, flashlights, uh, locate the vehicle and owner, as well as adding users. And there were some, some, different, uh, some different API calls that were made between each app. So that made me think that you know, there might be some problems for them to keep state. So I just noted that down, um, added a comment in burp. Now let me demo what I found last year here for you guys, just so you guys have some context. It's about a minute long. So this is a caching of all requests and responses here. You can't see, but there's a handoff token that I'm pointing to. It's very hard to see, but uh, in essence, it's cached. Again, all requests and responses. So it was sent over the URL, you know, that's a no-no. Um, so then it's in the cache database for iOS. So what I do is go ahead and, you know, see what tables I have, click in the middle of any SQLite database, because that's what I always do, just click in the middle. Uh, it's in hex right here, but I'll go ahead and change the text. And again, the handoff token is right here again. This video was sent to uh, Subaru, by the way, as well, so last year, when it was fixed. So just copied and pasted it, auto-logged in to the account. 
So this is my old vehicle, by the way. That didn't, that wasn't connected. So look, it says I'm logged out. Just copy and paste it again. Back logged in. You know, back back to being logged in without username, password, or anything. Just totally copy and paste. So again, that was that had been fixed and then was re-merged somehow, somehow. So I use that, obviously. I want to gain a valid session um, into a, a vehicle account. And so uh, my next step was to do some recon on the uh, web application. Similar, similar steps, just proxying the all, basically every call I can find uh, within the web application. So it had more capabilities. Uh, you, could you could also change what's called like a pin, a four digit pin, uh, security questions as well, uh, the personal data, uh, and seeing how uh, injection attacks work within the personal data. We'll get to that. This is all just the recon stage. Uh, and again, noted everything down and the differences between API calls and BERT. So from there, I noticed some potential roadblocks between each application and how it, and how it communicated with the server. I noticed there was unique session IDs almost as a CSRF token for the mobile apps. I couldn't find where they were originating from. I, it, it didn't look like it was coming from the, uh, the mobile apps. Uh, so, and it wasn't coming from the server. I was proxying the request. Uh, so I was also, so I just moved on. Uh, I, was, I was in fear of uh, session expiration, randomization. I wanted to basically have persistent access all the time and make sure my request always worked and executed. So even if I did a CSRF in anybody's car, it would still work. Um, and then so if the user configures email alerts, uh, they would get an email for each remote service call, so unlocking the vehicle, for example. And, and I said for most, because if you locate the vehicle, you don't get a notification. So that's kind of a safety thing there. So th those are some of the roadblocks, this, this one being the most important here. So some other observations. Uh, again, authorized users uh, who the car owner delegates have full control over the remote Oh, remote services. Owner, owner, the owner does not get notified of uh, adding users. Uh, the authorized users. Though I found a cross-site scripting in the vehicle name. So that was key, actually. So token and cross-site scripting uh, is a way to uh, attack, make this, uh, make this weaponized. And that's what I did. Uh, there was no anti-CSERF tokens for any state change of configuration. So anything for the pins, for the uh, security questions, there was no CSRF tokens. Uh, and that's for mobile, web, uh, all mobile apps and all web as well, well only web app. Uh, and I noticed obviously the token never expires. It didn't even expire after logging out and we showed that. And even changing the password. So they had some ACL issues there, some authorization, authentication issues. And then once you uh, logged into your My Subaru account with a new device, so I have like five, six devices, um, you would get a new handoff token. So a new handoff token for a token that never expires, it kind of you know, expands that, that attack surface. Um, and I'll show you in just a bit how that looks like. Uh, so not very hard to grab, again, again. And even if they change the password, you'll still have access with this handoff token. So essentially, that's the, uh, the auth bypass. Uh, all you need is the uh, handoff token, uh, which does not require a username or password. And then again, URL you, you, you rewrite everywhere. Everything over get request. Uh, again, which is a no-no for any APIs. So here's the, the, uh, the vehicle name cross-site scripting, uh, unweaponized, but just to show you guys uh, the, um, you know, the ability to. And here's an example of, this is my car hacking email account. This is, I logged in with three different devices here. I have three separate tokens that are valid for the account. Again, that don't expire. And here's car hacking email one, logged in with three different devices, also has uh, three different tokens. So, and remember, I added these two users to my account. So these users can also, these tokens are also valid for my account. So it's like kind of, you know, daisy chained almost. Uh, so, th so that's not cool. So some other observations that, that, uh, that I found. Again, we talked about get requests everywhere. But, those get requests did not have, uh, well, they can't CSRF, but it didn't have any session IDs that I was worried about for the mobile apps. And that's how I was able to CSRF um, all the web service calls, the remote service calls. I could just literally uh, template them out and uh, enter the values, and they would execute. 
and again, solves the unique session ID problems we had with the mobile apps. And then the web application did not require uh, security questions uh, to execute remote service calls, but the mobile apps did. So, <laughs> and uh, once you have, well, actually, the car pins, that four digit pin, it didn't always have to be sent. It's trusted after for a number of minutes, but it could be changed without validating the previous pin. As you can see here, it just says create pin and confirm pin, and then. Um, here are the security questions. So either way, I mean, you can, you can change those if they are required if at some point. Uh, you can always change those because they, they, don't, they don't ask you for the pin already, the, the previous pin. And they don't ask you for the previous security questions. They ask you just to update them and, and uh, put new ones in there. Uh, the car is also vulnerable to replay attacks. So the API, was no, there was no rate limiting. Uh, you can execute as many as you want. Uh, except not, not while driving. I know people are probably thinking that, but not while driving uh, the, re the remote service calls work. Uh, but you had to wait five seconds again because of the internet, of going through uh, from my connection to AWS and back to my car uh, via 4G. So at this point, I felt like I had a lot to go off of. I have a token that never expires. Uh, I have cross-site scripting. I could CSRF my way. I was flying. So I was... At this point, okay, so I have to chain some, some of these vulnerabilities together. Uh, what I did was create a malicious, a malicious page uh, with a cross-site scripting payload uh, to gain the valid session to acquire the token. Uh, and then from there, I, add, I added the users via CSRF, and then I made the, C, uh, the remote service calls via CSRF. Uh, so I automated this, but you could also do it manually and change the pin and, and uh, change the security questions like I mentioned earlier. And also just track the... the uh, the owner. They're not going to get notified when you log in, and there's no concurrent login either. So you can log in with 20 different users, and the owner would never know or add as many users as well. This was just earlier today. This is my car, and this is me, and this is how you could track a user. Cars over here in California. But, anyways, it's not, and, and it's lovely because it gives you this little location thing here where it opens up maps and it gives you directions right to the vehicle. So. You can always basically know where they're at. Uh, and, and there's also API, API calls for this as well. So you can uh, just use JSON, for example, JSON output, and just over time track. So here are some attack scenarios that people are probably wondering. And again, I always use uh, the cross-site scripting as the easiest one uh, to get executed. Uh, but you can look at the victim's logs. Uh, you can back up the mobile devices to view um, or to get access to the handoff token, for example. Um, you can use uh, you know any type of man in the middle uh, to victim the traffic uh, to uh, man in the middle of the victim traffic. Um, again, you can use you can export this cache DB file via iFunbox for iOS. Um, so since these are all over GET requests, if you're logged into your My Subaru account over a network that logs uh, or or does man in the middle of your connections in enterprise, that's going to be leaked. Uh, any you know type of uh, you know, third parties, whatever it may be, social engineering. Uh, you can uh, have the victim log in to their uh, My Subaru account on, on your device and be like, yeah, just show me. Unlock your car from here. Um, and you could also, again, audit logs within uh, not only the, the mobile apps, uh, but also within the browser or install via uh, malicious applications. There's a number of uh, different techniques and ways you can, you can exploit um, these vulnerabilities here. Uh, here's the auto login. Literally, I just press login, and it auto logged me in. So if I have, you know, a victim login with my phone, all I have to do is just press login, and I'll have the cache database, and it'll be fine. I'll always have access. So some other post uh, exploitation scenarios. Once I do have access, and I did successfully attack uh, a Subaru user or vehicle, uh, I think the obvious is still in the car contents. What's in there? Uh, sabotage the vehicle's engine, pop open the engine, and it could be expensive. I know for my car, uh, you know, it could, could run up pretty fast. Uh, or retain persistence to a car's account without making any type of changes or adding just adding users. Implant an out-of-band tracker, a Wi-Fi pineapple with GSM under, under the seat maybe, in the trunk, a uh, number of different ways you can do that. And you could also attack, you know, their local network, um, you know, re reconnaissance or recon their own... Uh, a corporate environment as well. But again, I think the, the biggest one here is personal safety risk uh, for you know, unlocking someone's car, uh, leaving them vulnerable to 
uh, stealing of their contents, whatever's in the car, but also themselves for locating uh, for privacy purposes. And there's a, top, there's a, there's a bunch more as, as far as uh, post-exploitation uh, scenarios that, that you can do uh, once you have access and once you ex successfully exploited this vulnerability, or these. But the likelihood and impact is that, okay, only mid-2016 and up, Subarus have telematics. Uh, the owners have to purchase uh, the uh, Subaru uh, Starlink services. And it's, it's kind of a targeted attack, right? You can't spray and pray this. You, kinda, you have to know who has uh, a Subaru and has a Subaru with telematics. But that's similar to all uh, IoT and car hacking for the most part. It's also warmable via you know, the authorized users that were added to the account. So the impact's kind of low for now. Again, it's the first year that they released this. So uh, you know, and all, their, all their vehicles from now you know, move, moving forward are going to be connected. Uh, so the likelihood right now is, is kind of low. Uh, but I see the impact as being high. And again, moving towards the future, I think it's going to you know, continue to rise and uh, have more features to be, <laughs> to be exploited for people like us and people like you guys as well. You know, just, this is why I do the research and trying to share you know, my methodology, because you guys can do it too. You can see how kind of simple it is. Uh, as far as the tools are concerned of what I use, feel free to ping me. I'll definitely share those. Uh, so as far as you know, after the fact, like I said, uh, Subaru was great to work with. Uh, I, I have always tried to point uh, vendors in the right direction when reporting bugs. So I usually uh, point them to disclosure policy, ISO 29147. I point them to NHTSA, best practices for modern uh, vehicles, the DOT's federal autom uh, automated vehicle policy, uh, auto ISAC best practices, and the observations and recommendations on connected vehicles, uh, connected vehicle security from Cloud Security Alliance. Uh, most importantly, I also point them to the Five Star Automotive Cyber Safety Program for Mind the Calvary. Uh, definitely a great place, good community. Um, you know, if, if, so, if someone in the connected vehicle space wants to get involved, I think we already have most of the manufacturers working on Subaru right now um, who are, are trying to get involved here or any of these areas. Uh, but, but moving in the right direction uh, as far as uh, connected vehicle space is concerned. Uh, but some of the other lessons are, you know, learn from others' mistakes, uh, continuous testing, internal, external, some crowdsource pen testing, like you know, people are doing already with Bug Crowd, for example, or Hacker One, uh, and similar similar organizations. So uh, Subaru took some steps after I reported those bugs. They deployed uh, their new their new applications. They started output encoding. Uh, they have a last logon message, which is nice. Uh, they don't send raw, raw credentials over clear text or over HTTP. Um, and here's an example of what they send when you're logging into uh, your, your account. Literally just uh, stars, asterisks. And now you, get, you, now you have an, uh, a, an account lockout for incorrect pins. Uh, you can also deauthorize devices here. Uh, here's a lockout button, your last logon. And here's output encoding. I still like that, by the way, today. <laughs> so they're taking steps, uh, and, and that's good. You know, can't expect them to be perfect. Um, especially without a security team. But it's great to see them you know, embrace uh, the culture in the community and trying to work towards uh, a more you know, a, a secure posture for connected vehicles. And they're looking to get in this space, like I said. Uh, so that's all I have. Uh, before I you know, get off the stage, are there any questions? One question? <laughs> yes. Yeah, the question was, how easy would this be to repeat for another vehicle? Very, very simple. I think it's happened before with Nissan Leaf. Uh, similar, a similar type of uh, uh, research. But you know, for mobile apps, they're much simpler, but code gets pushed much more often. Um, so, and, and there's web applications, so the attack surface is large. So it's very, it's very, very likely impossible that at a time some manufacturer is going to you know, slip up, but also fix those issues as well. So it's, it's definitely likely. Any other last questions? Yes. Uh, what do you think will be the effect to uh, 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 like the self-driving cars in the future? I mean, if, uh, yeah. these, are, these cars are easily hackable, like I Sure, sure. So the question was, uh, what would be the effect with like, autonomous vehicles in the future for research like this? Well, the, well I think the likelihood will be, would be higher because it will be more, more common, and the impact is going to be critical. It's going to be really, really high. Uh, and again, it's just a matter of the, the vendor turning around the patches quick enough, because 
the, you know, the risk is always going to be there, but it's about patching those vulnerabilities uh, within, a, within an acceptable time. So definitely likely. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>